All right, good day everyone. Welcome to today's broadcast. So moving right along, we're talking about inventor surfacing and freeform modeling. And what you may notice right off the bat is I did not list a version of inventor that we're going to be dealing with. Uh, the reason is this particular set of functions and features are within a couple of different versions of inventor. So you don't have to be on 2019 or 2018. You can be as far back as 2015. The interface is going to be slightly different going through the different versions, but the capability is there. So again, my name is Kindred Cooper. I'm an MCAD Solutions Engineer with Hagerman and & Company. And running the background Q&A, we've got Kevin Bosch, also an MCAD Solutions Engineer with Hagerman & Company. So the next slide, if you can hear me, great. Obviously, this is for those who cannot but it also showcases the Q&A panel. Either during the broadcast, you're more than welcome to enter questions and Kevin will address them, but we will also have designated time at the end to address those questions. So by all means, if you have any audio difficulties, video difficulties, anything like that goes on, shoot a question in there and Kevin will help you out. So let's move right along. I don't have a lot of slides to show you today. I've just got a couple of slides and then I jump straight into the live demo, so I'm not going to drag this out too much. But I do need to cover some very basic differences. And one thing that comes up a lot in discussion of surface modeling is what's the difference between a solid and a surface? The bare bones of this is a solid is considered to be a lump of material. And it has a parametric history associated with it. You've got extrusions, you've got revolutions, you've got fillets and holes and drafts and things like that to build that solid model. It has mass. You can associate a material with it, and the material density combined with the volume gives you that mass. It also has a center of gravity calculation, and it permits Boolean operations. That's your join command or your join option in extrude or revolve, your cut option and your intersect option. The difference from the solid to the surface is the best way to think of a surface, infinitely thin sheet of material. It has no mass whatsoever. Typically with surface modeling, you can have some parametric history. You're going to do extruded surfaces, revolve surfaces, but you're not going to have that additional Boolean operation. There's not going to be any extrude cuts or revolution cuts. Usually uh, surfaces are handled in a different manner. Also, um, there are no physical properties for surfaces. You can't assign a material to them because there's no mass calculation, there's no volume calculation. Looking across the bottom on the left, you're looking at a solid cube on the right, you're looking at the same exact sized cube created as a surface. So you'll notice that the ends of it aren't uh, capped off. So you can see right through it and see the internal walls. Again, it's good to think of surfaces as an infinitely thin sheet or a, a deck of cards that you're going to basically glue together to make whatever shape you're going to be working with. So why use surfaces? Uh, a lot of engineers start hearing surfaces and trying to work with surfaces and very quickly they get burned out because it is a different mindset that, that it takes to work with surfaces. You can't approach it from the traditional solid modeling workflow. You got to kind of twist your brain around and think differently because the outcome, the end result is going to be a little different. You're primarily going to use surfaces when you get into incredibly complex shapes. A few versions back in Inventor, if you tried to perform certain sweep operations, you would encounter an error and the error name was self-intersecting loop. In many cases, when you encountered that, the only way to get around that was to recreate that geometry as a surface, then you could get around it in most cases. So you were getting, you were dealing with some complex geometry, so you had to use surfacing to, to generate that geometry. Um, solid modeling might leave some extra material, garbage material, leftover material, however you want to describe it, but it's little pieces of 
solid mass that's left over. Okay, you had to create this shape with a loft and then a sweep and then a fillet. And when you did all of that, there's this little tiny lump left over at the end. And it's the result of how the loft came through an extrusion or the sweep turned a corner. There's just this little piece left over that you don't need. That's considered a garbage feature. There's various ways of dealing with that. You can clean up some of it. You can come or cover up some of it. In a lot of cases, when you're dealing with surfaces, though, you can break those surfaces down to where you can remove that garbage material. Uh, also, you would use surfaces if you wanted to limit your modeling history. Now, this comes into play if you're wanting to send your design outside to a, another vendor or maybe uh, a partner that you're working with to design some project, and you don't want to give over any proprietary information. The internal components or the outside sh shape, you want to make it as difficult as possible for somebody to reverse engineer it. So you can construct your model using surfaces, or for that matter, break it down and change it into surfaces. That way they can't easily extract, here's this sketch, here's this extrusion, and get all of that measurement detail. So now let's twist this up a little bit. So today we're talking about surface modeling and freeform modeling. Well, what's the difference? What, what would freeform modeling be and what would it be used for? The capability for Inventor was introduced in Inventor 2015. And the best way to think about it, virtual clay. It's a, a lump of geometry that you start grabbing and pulling and twisting and turning. Uh, you can kind of sort of shave off corners. You can push corners in. Be very much like having that mass of material in your fingers and just working with it. It is a mesh of surfaces that are connected by T-splines. Many may not be familiar with what T-splines are. If you've ever heard of Rhino, this technology was developed and incorporated into, to be incorporated into Rhino, and Autodesk bought the technology and plugged it into Inventor. T-splines are very close cousins to NURBS. If you've never heard the term NURBS, NURBS deals with advanced surface modeling. Uh, it stands for non-uniform rational B-spline, and it's an advanced curvature definition, typically based on spline curves with extra math on how to control the control points of the spline curve. T-splines are almost identical to NURBS. NURBS is an older technology developed on older platforms. T-splines are very new, developed in modern platforms. So the industry as a whole is kind of shifting their focus towards using T-splines. The math that goes into T-splines and NURBS is the same advanced math, very advanced algorithms. It takes a lot of programming to get this to work out. So it's a high-end surfacing and modeling level to create your geometry. Uh, another term that you hear some in the industry use is taffy pull modeling. It's essentially what it's like. You got a block of material just like clay or taffy and you pull and stretch it to get your different shapes. With freeform modeling, you are given a start point of some basic primitives. Box shape, plane shape, cylinder, sphere, torus, and a quad ball. That helps get you started, but you can also take an existing model and you can convert those faces into untrimmed uh, T-spline surfaces for mesh modeling. So what is it used for? Okay, well, you can use freeform for concept modeling. Uh, if you look at the image on the lower left, the basic shape of an SLR camera, perfect example for using freeform because to work in this mindset of generating a camera shape using solid modeling, it can be tricky. Yeah, you've got some lofted shapes in there, you've got some draft angles, but it needs to be smooth. For one reason, it's a consumer product. So you're looking for ergonomic fit, form, and function in the hands of the user. So you want nice, smooth contours. Surfacing usually comes in in this area, but to do this with surfacing, it's much more compl complicated and drawn out. So you'd also use free form for any kind of geometry manipulation that is too difficult for surfacing. Again, back on the camera, you could do it with surfacing, but it's gonna take too much time and effort. 
Uh, you're also going to use it when you've got smooth contours, curves, ergonomic designs, as I mentioned. And you can mix it with solid and surface modeling uh, practices when you're dealing with unique contours and need specialized control. Looking at the kind of claw hook uh, com component down on the right end, there is a mix of solid modeling and mesh modeling because trying to do this with a loft wasn't working out. I uh, kept using cross sections and different control rails and things, and it just wasn't giving the output that the customer wanted. So you introduce mesh modeling, and you're able to tweak those surfaces better. Um, in the middle is from Inventor 2015. Started out just being the head of a Doberman, kind of playing around and learning it. And to get that final form took me about 40 minutes. So learning curve wise comes into play here when you're talking surfaces versus freeform. The learning curve for solid modeling, for example, if you're in Inventor and using it daily, you can become pretty proficient in it in a week, uh, even more so in two weeks. With surfaces, you're going to have to get in there and brute force go through it and force yourself to use that workflow and it can be challenging uh, even going through training it can create a hurdle when you're trying to go from solid to surfacing learning curve for being proficient at surfacing probably close to a month so right there you're three or four times longer than with part modeling learning curve for mesh modeling about five minutes it is literally that quick it's easy to get in there understand what's going on and just start pulling things out it actually functions more in how our brains are designed to function. Just grab it, pull it, let me do what I want to with it. So with that in mind, let's go and just jump into it. All right, starting out, we're going to look at surface modeling, some of the basics of surface modeling. So what I've got displayed here are two simple two-dimensional sketches. Each of them has a series of arcs or spline curves. Now, when I incorporate something like a loft shape, of course, I can get a lofted surface, and I'll just turn off the translucent and get some nice, get some nice curvature definition in there. I'm going to back up, and I'm going to incorporate a third type of geometry to create that surface, and that's going to take place inside a 3D sketch. In a 3D sketch, it's a different animal than a 2D sketch. You get some different uh, utilities to use, one of those being an intersection curve. So what I'm going to do with this is choose my first 2D uh, sketch, then my second 2D sketch, and what this command is actually going to do, it's going to look at the profiles of each of them, and as they intersect, it's going to create a 3D sketch curve out here in space. So again, what's happening is it's looking at the front profile, how this shape projects back and intersects with the other sketch profile shape projected up, you get a mix of the two. So it's a 3D curve. I can incorporate that in, into the loft command and get a much more dramatic shape definition, again, using surfaces. The trick to using or generating surfaces anytime you have an open profile, which means the endpoints are not connected, Inventor is going to generate a surface entity instead of a solid. Uh, even if it's a closed profile like a square or rectangle or a circle, when you choose extrude or revolve, you do have the option to uh, generate that as a surface instead of a solid. Looking more so on some of the other commands in a 3D sketch that will provide subsequent geometry for use for use in surface modeling, Back inside that 3D sketch, you have the project to surface command with various options on this. You're going to choose what curves or what sketch geometry to project onto particular surfaces. So I've got a cylindrical surface uh, modeled out here, and my various options are project along a vector, project to closest point, or wrap to the surface. If I leave the default and project along the vector, it's going to project normal to the sketch geometry, to the, the two lines in the arc. And it's going to project it back onto that surface, and you get this curved shape. Okay, well, what does this curved shape do for me? I can use this for various things. 
I can use the split command to break up the cylinder surface with that curve geometry. I can trim it out in the surface tools and use this as a cutout for some kind of notch, some kind of anchor, who knows what it's going to be used for. The next one to look at is same cylindrical surface that I'm going to use, but I'm going to wrap to that face. So I'm going to project on that, project on that same face and my curves are going to be these pieces of geometry here and it projects it and it wraps it around in a sense you're getting a path that you can follow with a sweep cut maybe a cam path as a screw path follower who knows what you could use this for the nice thing about these is yes it's a projection okay so I cannot come in here and directly edit the yellow line it's a projection just like standard project geometry in a 2d sketch but they are associated back to the source geometry. So if I come back and I edit this particular sketch and I change, let's say I just kill the dimensions to give me a little bit better control, if I change the length of the main arc when I finish the sketch, the projected wrap updates. And that's the nice thing about using these intersection curve commands and the projection commands is they update that geometry live. It's not just a static view of it. Another one of the commands to utilize on that project to surface, I've got a surface plane out here. It's kind of a curvy plane, just made using a lofted shape. And I'm going to project to the closest point, and I'm going to project that spline curve. Again, when you're working with surfaces, you're actually getting a curve that follows and intersects that entire surface topology. So the projection is actually curving and following along. And again, you could use this for a cam follower or something like that. So when you're working with surfaces, what can you do with it once you have a bunch of surfaces created? Well, take for example, in this particular file here, we have a series of surfaces that are creating an airtight void for lack of a better description. Inside here, there are no gaps, there's no open areas. All of these surfaces intersect with each other, they cross over each other. So that can help us generate some modeling geometry. I can use the sculpt command on the surface panel and I can select these various surfaces to generate and fill that void area with solid material. So I end up with this solid block of material. It's the startings of a mouse design for a computer. You can use the sculpt command to not only build material but also to cut material away to get different contours and different shapes. So you can build with surfaces, again, open profile, extrude, revolve, and use sculpt to close in all of those surfaces. Going a little bit farther and reintroducing that 3D intersection curve, let's look at this particular file here. We're working with a series of 2D and 3D sketches. When I extrude, here's the option. By default, extrude will create a solid, but you can choose to create a surface if need be. For this operation, I'm going to choose the um, sweep option sweep that profile along this straight line path and I'm going to incorporate a guide rail. Now again this is creating solid geometry for me so how can I mix in surfaces with this? I'm going to create one more sweep and another guide rail. And that gives me a handle. This is the startings of a hairdryer and you've got the finger grips down here. If I look, I've also got an extruded surface. Now again, this is just a simple sketch. Slice my graphics so you can get in here and see this. A uh, simple uh, arc or spline curve sketch. And I've just extruded it, making a sheet, so to speak. In the 3D sketch command, I can use that to create an intersection curve. So previously I had two 2D sketches and I used use those to create the intersection curve. You're not limited to just using sketches. I can use this existing feature and this existing feature. So it's looking at the surface topology and how they intersect and it gives me this yellow projected curve. Okay, so what does that do for me? If I turn off the visibility here, there's another sketch right here inside of this, just a little rectangular shape type sketch. 
and it's a hair dryer, it's a consumer product. So let's kind of jazz it up a little bit with some surface designs. I'm going to use the sweep command again, sweeping this rectangular profile, and my path is going to be that intersection curve that I just created from the surfaces. And I'm going to cut that. Well, the problem is back here at the beginning, it's staying nice and normal to the barrel of the hair dryer, but out here at the end, it's twisting. It's twisting around. We don't want that twist. We want it to stay normal as it follows that surface. So you can use the path and guide surface option of the sweep command. The nice thing about this, if this was not a solid and it was still just, just a surface shape, you could still use that surface to help guide this cut. So now when I choose that as the guide surface, it maintains that normal alignment to the surface and I get a groove that I can then apply fillets and cutouts and little designs to jazz up this hair dryer for consumer products. Let's go a little bit farther into the nitty gritty of services. So what we've got here is a surface of a razor, electric razor. And we need to do some geometry adjustments. So I'll just go ahead and take out this particular step. Oops, one too far. Take out that particular feature. And it's going to leave me with this open surface here. I could even break out the stitch and break it down to the simplest form. Again, basic surfaces, a couple of different surfaces created from a sweep from a loft and from an extrusion. You'll notice with this surface, there is no mass. If I run an eye properties on this, look at my physicals, no mass, no area, no volume, because it's an open profile, it's an open set of surfaces. I need to cap off this bottom end. And a couple of ways I could do that. In the surface panel, I can extend faces. That's one way of closing this in. And you can apply uh, measurement value, how far you want to extend it, but you can you can run into little issues with surfaces. If you extend it too far, then you get little mathematical discrepancies, and that's kind of what you're seeing here. The surfaces are, are starting to break apart from each other, and they're kind of overlapping. This is one reason that a lot of people don't want to use surfaces. It's a, it's a challenge to make adjustments and clean up some of that geometry, or it can be a challenge. So I could use the extend to bring that up if I wanted to, or I could just use the boundary patch. What the boundary patch does is it looks for a chain of edges, and if it doesn't pick up the loop, you can pick edge, 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 edge until you generate the loop. It doesn't have to be uh, auto-selected, but it's going to patch over that opening with a surface. A couple of controls you have with boundary patch, it can be a free condition, so it just flat face across this, or it can be tangent, so it's going to look at the surrounding surfaces and create a patch that's tangent to those surfaces. As you see, it bumps it up. Or you can choose the G2 Smooth, and G2 is a higher level of curvature continuity control. Uh, you're getting into Class A surfacing and ergonomic designs when you're using G2 curvature control. It changes the profile slightly. We'll just go ahead and keep that. You'll notice all surfaces default to be translucent. That option can be disabled just by unchecking translucent in the tree. And you can change the surface color as well. You can use the appearance pull down on this just like you can solid modeling. So where this can come into play is not only in the design of the electric razor itself, but what if your job is you're the tool shop that's going to make the fixturing for this? How can you use surfaces? Well, more than likely, they're just going to send you a surface. They may not send you the solid geometry. They might just send you the surface profile that could have come out of Rhino or Alias or who knows. They're just sending you that surface model. In that situation, you can still use it. So what we've got here is that same razor design, and I've created a fixture plate, jig plate, and we're basically just going to create a way to mount this and keep it stable so that we can drill some holes in it, in it for the battery cover and various little things like that. Uh, problem is there's no flat area on here to grab a hold of or, or hold steady with a clamp. 
So what we can do is we can make a formed fixture. Now the bottom piece here, the bottom plate, I've already cut it out for the size and the shape of the end of the electric razor. But up here on the support block, I haven't cut it out. It's just got the surface laying into it. So here's how you can use these surfaces that are being sent to you, and you can use them to modify your solid geometry. I'm gonna take this block, and I'm gonna edit it through the context of the assembly. Okay, then I'll take and use the command copy object. What this does is it allows you to copy faces or an entire body and promote it into your existing component as a surface. So I'll just copy out these faces. Actually, I'll copy out the whole body. That'd be more straightforward. Just go ahead and grab them all. And you can choose for it to be associative or not. If it's associative, then it will change and update as changes are made to the surface file. Okay, so right now it doesn't look like a lot changed. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna return out to the assembly and open my support block by itself. What you'll notice now is you see a surface representation of that razor existing in this support block. I can use the sculpt, com uh, sculpt command to cut out that geometry. The only thing I'm gonna have to do first is patch up that composite and stitch it as a surface and then use the sculpt command to cut out that material. So it's still working with surfaces, no solid geometry yet, but it's looking at those surfaces where they intersect that support block and it cuts out that material. Well, I actually did a, a join instead of a cut. That was my fault. There we go. And cutting the wrong direction, so we'll just flip the direction and cut out that center pocket. So now we have a very formed holding area. If it's if you don't like it being an exact shape, you can always use the thicken and offset command and offset these faces inward, we'll say a thousandth of an inch, two thousand, whatever kind of type of clearance uh, or tolerance that you're comfortable with. So even though you're working in solids, you can still utilize surface geometry to manufacture against and, and build shapes from. That's surfacing in a nutshell. So how does that differ from freeform? Freeform modeling in an empty part, there is a create freeform panel and you have your primitives that you can start with. So if I look at something like a primitive box, for example, you're gonna choose the sketch plane that you're gonna create this shape on to define your orientation. It is creating a center point rectangle, so you just pick the center point and you get a very rounded, properly looking mesh of surface. You can adjust your length and height. So we'll say seven by, we'll say five, and maybe three inches thick. And we're gonna go ahead and make it symmetric. Then you can adjust your face uh, mesh lines. So how many face, faces do you want across the length? Well, I'm gonna jump this up to maybe seven. Across the width, I'll jump this up to maybe, we'll do five on that and probably, I'll do five on that one as well. You can choose to have symmetry automatically when you're creating this shape, but you can also define symmetry afterwards. So I'll define it afterwards for this. When I say okay, it takes me into the free form environment within Inventor. So you notice I have a entirely new tab that wasn't even visible a minute ago and different freeform related commands. So how does freeform work? Well, you're going to start by editing your shape. So I'll say edit freeform. You have an edit freeform dialog to, that allows you to choose various areas of this mesh. Now you can isolate it to say, let's just look at points. So when I just look at points, you see the node control points of each mesh intersection. Or let's just look at edges. Then you're only selecting edges. You can't select anything else. Or isolate it to faces or everything. You can select points, you can select edges, you can, you can select faces. When you choose any one of those items, here's what happens. So right now I'll just, I'll choose a control point. 
and you get various little names for this guy, 3D Gizmo, Triad, Transform Handlebar, see all kinds of different references to it, but the function is the same. You get three arrows to move and relocate that point, face, or edge along the X, Y, or Z axis. And you can even control how you make that adjustment. Is, is that X, Y, Z orientation based on the world coordinate system? Is it based on the view, which changes to a different uh, orientation, or based on the local coordinate system of the point, edge, or face? So you got some options there on how you want to move this. Once you click, say, we'll drag it out in the Z direction. Click and hold down on that arrow. When I drag it, you'll notice it pulls that point, but look what happens to the other faces and edges around it. This is why it's called taffy pull. It's adjusting that geometry of those faces and edges to move with it. Now you can type in values. You do have numerical control on this, but there's no dimension to tie it into. There's no parametric history being kept. Again, this functions kind of how we want it to function, how our brains think. Grab it, let me move it, I'm not worried about dimensions yet. You also have control to move it spatially two directions at a time. So that's what each one of these little plane squares are for. So if I choose the bottom plane, it's going to move that point in the X and Z direction on the XZ plane, and it's not going to adjust it in the Y direction, it's just going to do X and Z. Uh, inversely, you can scale it. So while it doesn't work much with a point because you're not going to change anything, if you're working with an edge, you can scale the edge to increase the length or decrease the length of the edge. Same thing goes with a face. You can scale, as soon as I get the mini toolbar out of the way, you can scale that face to increase its size or decrease its size. And then you have the rotation arrows. Now this works great on all three of them, points, faces, and edges. When you choose the rotation handles out at the end, you can actually change the contour just by rotating, and I'm working with a control point, and it's changing the contour as follows. Now, the nice thing about this is whatever edit you make, when you finish the freeform environment, it converts it into a solid lump. It is a solid block, so long as your edits have not violated any of the algorithms that define it as a solid. When you start pulling faces into each other and crossing over and things like that, you can get some weird topology that it cannot convert into a solid. You can define symmetry. So when I choose symmetry, let's say I'm going to choose symmetry on the side here. I want to define symmetry between the top and the bottom, so I'm going to click two faces and in between those it's going to define symmetry. You see it mimics the behavior I've already set up out here previously. So when I choose to edit the form, now when I edit and drag out, or if I move it up, you see the bottom takes shape along with the edits made to the top. Using symmetry can cut down your modeling time in half because in here you're working usually in a symmetric sense. Uh, in the standard modeling environment, we have mirror commands that we can model just a quarter of it or half of it and mirror it over. Uh, there's no mirror command in here to tackle that. So symmetry allows you to set up that behavior. You can clear the symmetry of that solid to generate it. Once you have your solid generated or your mesh generated, then you can come in and you can use a mirror command that's in here to mirror your finished results. Back out of this, how is this going to work with surfaces and how is it going to work with solids? Let's take the example of seat cushions for cars and trucks, vehicles. So what I can do is I can start out by generating a basic shape of a seat cushion using surfaces. I've done an extruded surface here, just a 2D sketch that's an open profile, extruded out. Then I've done a lofted surface that's basically using three 2D sketches. So I've got the first sketch back here in the background, the sketch in the middle for the middle profile, and the sketch at the end for the last profile. Generating those using surfaces, I can stitch surfaces together into one entity, makes it easier and cleaner to select geometry. I can then use the trim command 
I'll trim out unneeded areas. So I don't need these pieces, these little V-shaped pieces out here. So I'll just use that stitched surface I just created and I'll trim out these areas. I can still use the trim command, use my lofted surface as my cutting tool, and then I want to remove the front area of that extruded surface that I created. So I end up with something like this. Again, a series of surfaces. You can stitch those together and then take this and add to it that freeform shape. So if we're making a cushion, we're actually going to want to try to size this thing accordingly to where we can make all the little curves and adjustments within it. Again, we're going to add more faces to get more uh, control over the mesh. We'll just add 11 faces. Well, actually, let's dumb that one down back to maybe five or six. We'll go with five. Okay, a few more adjustments I actually need to make. I'm going to edit the form, and you can grab the surfaces, and let's look flat to it. That would make it a lot easier. Grab the surfaces. I want to translate them out. I didn't make it the original one thick enough, so I'll just pull those out. Accept that flow. Look at my side profile. It's looking good. The sketch is in here, so what I'm actually going to do, or the surfaces are in here, what I'm going to do is just start editing this form. Well, actually, actually, after I specify symmetry, that make my job a lot easier. So I can start editing this form, and using the control key, you can select multiple faces and edges. You have to be careful if you do a dragging window because you're picking not only the items in the front, but also the items in the back, and then you can use the control key to deselect those. So you can take these faces and drag them back, and you see the original surface model poking through. So for something like a seat cushion, I'm going to drag these profiles back until I see good uniform coverage and interaction between the mesh and the surface. Now, this is a very time-consuming, tedious process. So I've already got a couple of these things in the oven and cooking. So I'll just jump to these guys. I've already done some adjustments here. The green is the surface model that I created. The gray is the free form. So I'll edit the free form. You see how the slight difference in color shows up. Again, just editing control points for this, I'm able to get the uh, mesh and the surfaces back to where they can interact with each other or intersect with each other. That tells me I'm matching up on that shape. So just drag it back just a little bit. And again, the nice thing is over on the other side, because I've built in symmetry, it's defining those controls as well, as you see the shape contours down and changes on the shading. So getting a little bit more of my seat cushion kind of adjusted. Again, I've got another one in the oven. I've already baked up. Got some more adjustments made to it. Getting closer, I got all the contour done in the back. The only thing I've got left is down here at the bottom. When I look in the mesh for this, I've got what looks like a sharp corner. One thing you might want to do to control and adjust this is you can take existing faces, you can break them up. So I've got all of these points and edges here. I want to increase my selection. So to do that, you can subdivide faces. So I'll just hold down the control key, pick all of these, go ahead and pick the one in the center, and it will subdivide those faces based on whatever options you choose, however many widths, however many lengths you want to work with. That's going to give you more faces, more edges, more control points to work with and make adjustments to round it out and finish it. So once you're done, jump out here to the finished product. I've got my finished with my free form right here. Just turn on visibility of it. You'll see very little of it kind of poking through. I got some very subtle surface deviations between it and the surface model. If I turn off the surface model, turn off visibility of that, you can see the freeform model. I've just applied an appearance to it to give it a texture like a seat cushion. We might need to make more adjustments though. If I turn on the visibility of my profile sketch, we can see, well, it's not big enough. 
So one question that might pop into your mind is, well, you created surfaces to start with, and then you made the free form match up the surfaces. Why not just use surfaces? This is why. Because I need to edit the form of this. I need to make it longer, and I need to make it thicker. Not enough cushion. So when I edit the form, just grab the surfaces I need to manipulate, make it a little bit thicker, grab the other surfaces I need to pull down to make this a little bit longer. I'm not going to stretch out that surface too much. I'll redo my selection here, grab some others. So far, that could be done in surfacing. No big difference. What cannot be done as easily in surfacing is to make the individual edits on the back of this to change the lumbar support and the location of the cushion. So we're going to drag these points out, get a little bit closer, drag these node points out, again to give the driver or the passenger better support. We need to change the outside contours on the wing locations of the chair or on the seat cushion, and again give better support to hold them in place. This could be a high-speed racing vehicle. It could be a construction vehicle. It needs a lot of support. Maybe fatten this guy up to give more cushion around the edges. This is the kind of stuff that to do it in surfacing would be a near monumental task. Um, you're going to spend a lot of time trying to construct these cross sections to get all of this math to work out. Now, you, you'll also notice I can't click OK. What that means is I've got something wrong in my surface topology. It's not liking the mesh. Something's wrong with it. So the easiest way to see those issues is to turn off the smooth contours. And what you're looking for are lines and edges that disappear, like on this vertex here. Got some things getting out of whack, so I need to clean up a couple of these points. As soon as I do that, OK lights up. I got a good shape and I can turn on the smooth. So now I've got a seat cushion that's sizing better, has more of the contours that the customer has asked for, or more of the contours that we're seeking. So looking at that mix, one question that comes up with surfacing and with uh, freeform modeling especially, is it mud box? Uh, some of you may have seen Autodesk Mudbox. If you haven't, I advise you Google it. It is really cool looking stuff. Very impressive. The difference between it is different industry target, different technology. Mudbox is targeted at artists, uh, game designers, uh, game character designers, and some product designers. Yes, you're getting you know more ergonomic designs, but it's an, it's core audience is artistic and game related uh, type audiences and, and entertainment audiences like movie uh, editing, uh, special effects editing and things. You start out with a basic primitive solid in Mudbox just like you do with Freeform and then you start tweaking it. It looks very similar on what you're doing but Mudbox has different tools and different techniques that's more centered around virtual clay. Whereas in mesh modeling in Inventor they're just giving you the ease of grabbing surfaces, points, and edges and just move them. Uh, we can flatten out things, we can add creases to things, we can bridge surfaces, we can torque surfaces, but one thing we can't do is control texture mapping on that surface. That's where the artistic side comes in on the character he's got here. You've got something like scales down around the chest plate. You've got different what may be hair follicles or skin creases. All of that is done with texture mapping in Mudbox. So the technologies look similar, but they are very dissimilar. With that, we will open it up for questions. Kevin, how's the Q&A panel looking? Or how's it been looking? Um, it's been, yeah, it's been pretty good. Um, quiet so far. Um, the um, the Seat, dem seat cushion demonstration was extremely applicable. Um, one of the questions was uh, was directly related to creating seating, so um, that uh, that looked out pretty good. Um, there's so far we've had a question about uh, the difference between Fusion 360 and uh, Inventor, and then um, CNC for Inventor. So I've answered those. 
Okay. Um, can you add dimensions? Here's here's one from Randy. Uh, can you add dimensions to the free form? Well, to short answer is no, because it's designed to be controlled by adjustment dimensions, not overall dimensions. What you're actually going to do is, like I did in the seat, in the uh, seat cushion demo, have a sketch that has your dimensions and your shapes, and use that as a guideline. Uh, essentially, your sketch or your surface is going to be an overlay that you're going to adjust the freeform to get close to. And as I pointed out with the seat cushion, where freeform really comes in, it's not on those outer edges. That's that's kid stuff. No no big deal there. Where it really comes into play and gets your power is what happens in between. You know, one thing we have always uh, mentioned with lofted features and swept features, especially with a loft, it's a mathematical best guess. And the only way you can get a better guess with lofts is more control rails. I have seen my share of surfaces where we could not figure out what that shape looked like halfway through unless we took the sample part and cut it into sections and traced over it and just a headache of a time. So with free form, you're able to control what happens in the middle without knowing what goes on in the middle. You can make the adjustments to it and have it look visually correct. Um, there's math behind it, yes, but there's no math to control the overall. So no dimension to control the overall. Very good. Um, let's see here. The next one, and this is definitely one um, that I'm not real familiar with, um, creating a relationship between 3ds Max and Inventor. Um, I'm not sure does 3ds Max pull out the uh, SAT or I just type files. It does create or it does pull out those files. It can actually pull in uh, Inventor native IPT files. Uh, last time okay. I checked, I think it was a service pack you had to download. But uh, there's no there's no existing current way to connect the two seamlessly and have them have one update the other automatically. Uh, it's still kind of an external export out, import in process. And for Max, you're going to pull a file into Max to add more texturing, more colors, higher uh, resolution rendering and material and lighting, and possibly even some animation. Sure, sure. Um, and then uh, surfaces converted to solids. Um, I'll let you dig deeper into that one, but uh, can, they, can that be done? Ha, you know what? That's an actual, that's a good question. So let me pull this up. The, the, uh, one of the questions that I answered earlier, one of the questions that I put out there, why didn't you just do this with surfaces? Why would you go through all this trouble to just take a surface and fill it with a free form? Okay, you saw part of it, but the other part is this. Let me turn off visibility of the free form and of the sketch. So when I bring my surface on, Everything looks nice and, and clean, doesn't it? Looks looks good. Looks Yeah, you got different colors because you can make faces be different colors. That's not a big deal. But one thing that I cannot do, you'll notice I can't put fillets on these edges. All right, it grabs that one. Doesn't grab that one. It grabs that one. Eighth inch fillet. That, that should be no problem. But it is a problem. There's issues in this surface geometry. Remember, surfaces can intersect each other, they can cross over each other, they can go through each other, they can have gaps between their edges. So you get into situations like that. For that matter, I can't even come back out here and reselect these pieces of geometry. I've got one subsequent stitch on some of these faces. I can't run another stitch because there's problems in this surface. So this is another reason you wouldn't want to tackle this solely with surfaces. You can fix these problems. We can take it into the repair environment, take it into the construction environment. Both of those are strictly for surface uh, diagnostics and surface corrections and remove parametric history so you don't have a tree full of surface modifications. Yeah, we can fix them. It's going to take time. It's going to take time for the learning curve. It's going to take time for the actual process. So that's why. I didn't use this or do this solely with surfaces. One reason is because of the errors in here, it will not let me convert it to a solid. But as you might have saw with the sculpt command, for example, if I come back in here to this guy, this is nothing but surfaces. 
good, clean surface geometry, no issues, and with the sculpt, we can take all of these surfaces, close it in, and make that solid block. So you can take existing surface bodies, you can stitch them, the stitch command will convert it to a solid if there's no gaps and no overhangs in the surfaces. So basically, if you have a good watertight seal and all the edges are clean, it'll automatically convert it to a solid. That's one of the benefits of Stitch. So if you download a step file or a sat file or an IGES file and it comes in as surfaces, sometimes that'll work. Sometimes it won't because of the quality of the file you're bringing in. Very good. Um, let's see here. Um, suggestions for uh, for continued training or continued learning. I know uh, YouTube has got a, a number of things out there. We don't have a specific surfacing class that I'm aware of. Um, we we actually recently added, and I recently taught the uh, surfacing and freeform modeling class about three weeks ago. We just just now found a, a training manual that will accompany it. We've been looking for one for a couple of years. Well, let's say it this way. We've been looking for a good one for a couple of years, and I think we finally found one. Uh, the class flows very well. It's uh, I can't remember if it's a one or two day class. Uh, it might it might just be a one day class I think, um, but it flows very nicely. You cover a lot of the surfacing tools, and you cover some good in depth basics of freeform. Very good, very good. That was one I was not aware of. Um, Here's a real good question. How well would uh, freeform models export into uh, the CAM software for machining? Um, would the splines be compatible for creation with G-code? And I think we've seen some uh, some examples of some of that. Yeah, I'd say it's going to depend on the topology and the curvature control of the mesh of the freeform. Uh, it could be 50-50. Uh, you might give some models that export well and others that might not. Okay. If you run into that situation and it doesn't export well, obviously contact Hagerman. We can help you out on that. Absolutely. And um, converting the freeform into a solid, that's pretty well done automatically when, um, when you export or, or exit the freeform environment. Is that not correct? That is correct, so long as the freeform is still a complete bound form. So in other words, if you go in and you delete one little face square, it's no longer mm -hmm. a bound form. There's an opening. So when that happens, it converts it into a surface. Very good. And let's see. Um, can you cut extrude solid models from freeform parts, um, then re-edit the freeform part? Um, and I believe kind of your your um, couple of different examples that you showed did did express some of that. Yeah, it did. the The challenge is the free form because it still exists in the parametric history, right? You still have that main history tree that's governing all of this. So you'll have the free form as one feature. The extruded cut will be below it. So when you go back to edit the free form, the cut is gone. Right. And uh, let's see. Let's see. We had some questions about HSM. Um, I think questions like that we'll address um, offline. We do have HSM presentations uh, if you're interested yep. in those as well. Those are coming up. We also have some archival ones on the website. Absolutely. Okay, well, uh, thank you everyone for attending today. Any questions that come in at the last minute or so, we'll definitely get back with you on those. If you have any other questions or want to see any other products or other demonstrations, by all means, contact Hagerman. We're happy to help you out. Uh, we offer phone support. We offer training in person. We offer uh, remote training, system setup, and consulting on, on system design and layouts. Uh, we're here to help you guys in any way we can. Thanks, Kindred, um, for the presentation.
Um, this will conclude our broadcast. If you do think of additional questions later, you can simply reply to the confirmation or reminder email you receive from GoToWebinar, and we can get those to Kindred or whoever to get your questions answered. And once again, if you could take a few moments to fill out the survey, it'll just pop up as we close down today. And thank you for attending today's webcast, and have a great day, everybody.